so intense for no reason other than because we can. <laughs> right? I love that that theme music so much. It's the oh goodness. Music. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Audience Building Boot Camp, week three of six. Um, this week, we're going to really start in getting into the nitty gritty and the tactical elements of building an audience, as it were. Um, this week is going to be very social media heavy, so get excited. So for those of you who have had lots of social media related questions, drop them in the chat as we're talking. <laughs> Swirls this way. It's over there. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Tara, anything you want to add? No, this is, don't get me wrong, I enjoy all of the audience building boot camp sessions, but this is one of my personal favorites because it's just such an integral part of how the world gets to know you as an author. Social media is a fun one, for sure. Like these down here. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Look at that. Mm. That's what we call So you can connect with us at any time if you want more tips or like we've talked about in the past, looking to other authors for inspiration. You know, I mean, feel free to be inspired by us or whatever. <laughs> we're very humble. Humbly. Um, and <laughs> you can drop your questions in the chat as we're going through. There will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, let's get started. Huzzah. Oh, right before, you know what, I'm going to stop sharing real quick because we actually do have a guest in the wings here who I would love to bring on. Once again, Mr. Ryan Porter would love to say hello to you all. Hello, hello, guys. How is How goes it? It goes indeed. Cool piano. It definitely wonderful. goes. <laughs> wonderful. I believe we are also waiting for the wonderful Miss Natalie Bailey. Has she arrived yet? I don't see her in the wings, but is there anything you'd like to say to the audience in the meantime? Um, absolutely, yes. So I am, um, it, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, one of the publishing strategists at New Degree Press. Um, if I've had the chance to hop on a call with you guys and talk about your book and talk about kind of your goals and, and all those wonderful things that, uh, that we hope to help you with over the coming months, um, wonderful. If not, um, I would love to, if we have a call to schedule, um, feel free to, to grab a time on my calendar if it warrants. Um, but really what I'm here for today is to introduce uh, kind of someone who's gonna help you along in the onboarding process. So we actually have um, the wonderful, hopefully, Natalie Bailey, who will be joining us um, sometime soon uh, to talk a little bit more about um, some of the onboarding that she helps us with, which is the video production side of your pre-sale campaign. So kind of as you guys do these workshops here with uh, with Kyra and uh, and Mackenzie, um, you know, you guys are working towards these pre-sale um, campaigns on Indiegogo. And part of that is to create a video. Um, so with that video, we'll be working with Natalie and her team to uh, to design that video, kind of give you a quick uh, trailer of your book and really tell that story. Um, so I'm just here to, to kind of answer any questions that uh, that come about given uh, given her her intro and um, and just kind of help answer any questions about the pre-sale campaign that you guys might have uh, creating the video and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, that's um, that's uh, I believe she also has a uh, a document to share with you guys um, so we can. If I can find that, I could drop that in to get things started. Um, it's an FAQ um, about the marketing, marketing materials. Um, so let me go ahead and drop a link to that into the chat here so you guys can use that. Um, it's an FAQ about all of the things related to you know, uh, the promotional video, uh, the the mockups. So we'll also be working with uh, with Natalie and her team to create mockups, uh, which we can use for social media type stuff. Um, so that will be in there as well. And really, it's just a list of questions, commonly asked questions that she gets um, for really everything related to to kind of what she helps you with. Um, so let me drop awesome. a, a message and see and see where she's at. Yeah, I know she's she might be. Having she issues. just arrived. Oh, I did think. she? I don't see her camera on, but I'm going to bring her in and see if her microphone's working. 
Hi, Natalie. Oh, Hi, goodness. everyone. I'm sorry. I, my camera's not working for some reason with this. I've never used this program, so I apologize for that. I don't know what's going on. Um, no Thank you for having me, everyone. Yes, Ryan, I heard what Ryan was saying, actually. So this uh, FAQ document should really give you guys some clarity on what I do um, and what my team does. I have an amazing team. Um, but what we do really, this is one of my favorite parts about New Degree Press is we really try to support our authors and help them find the most success with their upcoming launch and their pre-sale efforts by providing them with really great marketing materials that showcase exactly all the hard work they've been doing and getting you just putting you in the best light to really show what you've been creating and how excited your supporters and uh, future readers should be to absorb all that you've been doing. And I, I'm really proud of what we offer to authors. Authors are usually very excited about what comes out. Um, Despite many people, as I'm sure some of you guys are, being a little nervous about being on camera, we help you with that when it comes to doing the video. I have um, a team of what we call video production assistants that really work very well um, with authors and helping with that. And we have different templates for different formats. So if you're a creative author, we usually recommend kind of a what we call a book trailer, which is like a movie trailer of your book, which is really, really cool and awesome new template. Yes. And then for those of you that are more non-creative, we have what we call a book synopsis, which is you talking to your future supporters and readers and saying, this is what I've been working on. This is my intention. This is what I'm excited about. Um, and really showcasing who you are because, you know, with a nonfiction work, the author is, is as important, I would say, as the material itself, because you're really believing in what you're writing about and showcasing it in the best light. So I hope that gave a little bit of a synopsis of what we do that's helpful. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I'm actually thinking, so you just mentioned the two different types of videos that people can do. I know one of our very own, Stephen Howard, did one of the creative uh, trailers. Um, and I believe we've got an example um, of his trailer. Do you have uh, access to that link? Can we share that out um, and share out kind of what one of those looks like? Because I remember his was really, really good. It was really, really compelling. Um, do you have an access to, uh, to kind of one of those examples, uh, Natalie? What was his? I know he shared it on LinkedIn. Um, Howard. I'll have to go on his profile. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Stephen Howard, you said? Yeah. And I believe it was The City of Snow and Stars. Oh, nice. What a great title. Yeah. Have you guys seen, seen his video um, trailer? It was really, really good. They did a fabulous job on his trailer. Um, he shared, I remember he shared it a while back. Uh, where is I will it? also drop the link because I have it handy. I'll drop the link to my trailer. Yes. Uh, that was just made for me recently. Yeah. Any examples that you can provide? Because the team does awesome work. They really, really do. Um, on both examples, uh, both types, rather. The, the, the trailer type-esque that's kind of more compelling. It's more epic. It's more, you know, kind of emotionally driven. And it really captures the audience, especially for fiction authors. And then you've got the nonfiction, which really does, you know, an accurate job of telling kind of, what, 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 what are you hoping to do with this book? You know, kind of what is it that your mission is and, and who are you as the author? Um, so I think both really, really good examples. Um, and if I can find his link, um, I will share it. But I'm scrolling through his LinkedIn right now and I'm not seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So I have actually, I have one of our, I have Emily Vanderbent's um, uh, link as well. She's allowed me to share it with everybody. She's one of our, one of my video production assistants and also an author coach. And uh, I have hers up here as well that I'll share in the chat. It's fantastic. And uh, it, it just, it, hers, I love, especially, I did I don't remember seeing Stevens, Ryan, but uh, or his final one, but Emily's is so exciting. I mean, it, you watch it and I just cannot wait to pick up her book. Um, and yeah. I'm one of those like thriller mysteries, so one of those thriller mystery type of books. And she did an amazing job of piecing together an awesome uh, audio narration over it using incredibly timely and appropriate uh, stock footage. She worked with the editing team to make sure that everything was right on point. Um, and I, I highly recommend taking a look at those for sure. And I put, I put Emily's in the chat. Um, 
And for those of you that are more non-creative, not not non-creative, but more like <laughs> fiction and such, everyone's got creative. Um, <laughs> I'm going back to one of my favorites. Um, oh my goodness, let me see if I can find her. And it'll showcase more for you kind of what the option is for that. It's kind of a different, oh, there she is. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah, when you say non-creative, Natalie, I, I feel called out. I feel- <laughs> I apologize. I don't know if I <laughs> wanted to trigger anybody. No, it was bad. It's more of the- um, you meant nonfiction. Non I did fiction. mean nonfiction. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh, and I'm not finding hers, unfortunately. But I can give you guys a link to share Kyra and Mackenzie at some point with your yes to do that. If but I you have like any additional links you'd love to share with the audience, feel free to send them to us. Okay. Um, in the meantime, we don't want to take up too much of your time. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on and telling us about and giving us a sneak peek of Absolutely. the video production process. I know a lot of authors are excited about that. Yes, thank you for the time, ladies. I really appreciate it. Let me know if you guys have any questions. We're always here to help. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, guys. Of All course. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. You can find both of those folks on Quip if you have any additional questions about any of the things that they just mentioned. And without further ado, we're gonna get into the presentation. So, Get excited. We're talking about social media today. Building yeah, up I, that I'm, social media so that when you get your video, you can share it with all the people. Do all the things. I'm dancing for a reason, guys. <laughs> like, I'm very enthusiastic about this workshop. <sighs> okay, let's do this thing. Let's get social with the medias. Ah, yes. Mackenzie, would you like to introduce the meme of the week? You mean to tell me social media can help my career? Yes. <laughs> it's a necessary wow. evil at times is my general uh, feeling about it. You know, it can be mm. fun, but it can also be just consuming if you're not careful. Um, so setting healthy boundaries with social media is important in all of this. Um, recognizing your own patterns, habits, capabilities, just consider that. So a lot of what we're saying is advice. Um, you understand you best. Try not to overwhelm yourself. That's what I'll say about that. But it is really important um, in reaching your audience. Like we mentioned last week, now in, in today's era of the internet, 80% of the time, the first time someone meets you will be digitally, which can be kind of wonderful because you're reaching readers all across the United States, even the globe, um, which is not something that has wouldn't would have been possible if you were a writer a hundred years ago, right? Yeah, wild. <laughs> Absolutely huh. wild. I'll hop off my soapbox on that one and get to tell you about today's workshop. Uh, so social media, assessing your comfort level, um, really looking into where your audience is at currently and just assessing the social media and the digital president presences that you already have and leaning into those and potentially creating new accounts. But we'll get into that. Um, we do have a, a Excel spreadsheet template for you guys in the Quip folder. Um, and those, for those watching from the YouTube community in the free resources down below. So you guys should have your own version of that if you're in Quip. But this is a place where we'll talk more about it in a bit. Okay, Kyra. This is her favorite part. I'm, I'm so ready. Oh, the suspense is killing me. It's already there up. Are go. you not seeing it? There we go. Now I can see it. Now <laughs> I can see it. Treat your social media like a garden. I love metaphors. I really love garden metaphors for some reason. It, it just is what it is. So basically, when you guys are navigating social media, treat your social media ecosystem like a garden. So identify the plants. Plants are platforms in this context, yes, that are thriving and seek to, and, and you want to seek to maintain their well being. So, if don't get rid of a good thing, just make sure that their health is just continued to be maintained and sustained. You also want to be cognizant of the plants that are struggling 
and make a plan to fertilize them. So that would mean like facilitating their content scheduling and other forms of support, like learning about new features that are available on that platform, right? And finally, find and uproot the plants platforms that have been effectively, they, they're basically weeds at this point, and it's not productive for you to spend your time there. Actually, one of our incredible author coach colleagues, Stephen Howard, often says that it's good to have a presence on multiple platforms, but to really be focused and particularly engaged on a couple of them. But sometimes there are platforms like not to throw shade, but Tumblr tends to not be the most pertinent and vibrant space anymore. So if you were super active on Tumblr, then maybe that could be a weed depending on what your audience is now. Yes. Yeah, or MySpace. <laughs> Ooh, another one. Is that even still alive? Is it still alive? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so... Let's peruse the tools in your toolkit. I mean, it's fun to like give um, the platforms alternate identities. So imagine that LinkedIn is your authorpreneur hub. So authorpreneur is, what is it called when you, it's not a compound word. There's a, it's a French term for conjoined words. I can't believe I'm liking on it. But anyway, um, the authorpreneur hub. So LinkedIn is a space where you, as an author, see yourself as a small business and you orient your language to be more business professional as such. So you're connecting to fellow business owners, business operators in a very professional setting. And once you get to the pre-sale campaign of this process, if you are a member of the New Degree Press community specifically, um, and LinkedIn is a place where you can receive a lot of leverage from a professional networking capacity. So then we have Facebook. And Mackenzie could definitely attest to this about Facebook. But we call yes. Facebook the treasure trove because generationally speaking, <laughs> you're more likely to encounter people who have spare change <laughs> on Facebook than you are mm -hmm. on many of these other apps. And, and the other piece of it, too, is that when people are on Facebook, they are in very much a buying mindset because um, you've got things like Facebook Marketplace, Facebook ads. Um, you're already you want to meet people where they're already feeling like they want to buy things <laughs> is a really good thing to think about, especially when it comes to your fundraising campaign. Um, it's going to be a really popular place where people are sharing the fundraisers that they're doing. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. And also, oh. Reload site. Kara, can you still hear me? I can still hear you. I'm there. Okay, cool. I don't know why. <laughs> up. Leave me alone, computer. Okay. My computer's freaking out. Sorry, you guys. A anyway, um, by the way, the word that you were looking for earlier, uh, Kyra, is a portmanteau. See, I believe is how see? you pronounce it. Yes. See, I knew it was French. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. And Facebook works particularly well for you to, in um, your campaigns, right, Mackenzie? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, in so, both of my campaigns, there was an overwhelming more than half of the contributions came through to Facebook links that I shared. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where my audience that wants to buy things mostly lives. This might be different for you and your audience. Mm-hmm. So... Moving on, we have, and what's interesting is that a lot of these things are owned by each other, T, but Instagram, the image sharpener. So admittedly, most of the people on Instagram are not rolling in the dough, to put it in a young people fun way, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, this is a place where influencer culture definitely yes. can take root, and if you have friends that are very active on Instagram, the word of your book or the messaging surrounding your book can really go far because Instagram has so many ways in which content can be shared and engaged with. So it's the image sharpener because it gives you multiple opportunities to curate your presence in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Twitter. Oh, Twitter. <laughs> oh, Twitter. What a space. It's kind of, Twitter is one of those spaces where you're either ultra profession, professional, like a journalist, or the complete opposite. Like, it's almost as if being as, like, casual as possible, almost flippantly so, actually would get you farther than anywhere in between. Yeah. It's either you're ultra so casual true. or ultra professional. So strange. It's the tough but one. It's kind of a, it's a very much a, shout into the void kind of platform at times, um, which is why we call it the discourse sparker, um, because people will say things and flippantly freely express their hot takes even, and that sparks some conversation. Um, so like Kyra mentioned, though, journalists love Twitter. So if you're in the business of sharing your book and things about your book with various news and media outlets, literary journals and the like, being an existing on Twitter is going to be really helpful for when you go and DM journalists, which this is, and again, a pro tip. Journalists love to be DM'd on Twitter because their email inboxes are full. So if you at any point in time have a pitch, pro tip, send it on Twitter. We love to see it. And this one, I would love for Mackenzie to talk a little bit more about this one because she's killing it <laughs> on this particular platform. But Ooh. TikTok is a swag enhancer. The last time we went about doing this um, presentation um, in, our, in a much less cool way, because now we're all hip and high tech, right? But I did not have a TikTok. But then I was inspired by other members of the author community, including Mackenzie. And now I finally <laughs> have joined the dark side and have a TikTok. But Mackenzie, would you say that it is in fact the swag enhancer? <laughs> it is. And it is in fact the dark side because it's it can be <laughs> addicting, especially if you have a, a hyperactive personality um, <laughs> or a short attention span. Um, but that aside, if you guys are interested in at all learning more about TikTok, potentially downloading one and having an author TikTok, we do have a coffee chat on this channel, um, how to go viral on book talk specifically, which is like a niche area of TikTok. It's not a separate app. It's still TikTok. It's just a hashtag that a lot of uh, people who love to read and write live under. So mm -hmm. go give that one a watch. Um, but we're also happy to answer any additional questions about that. And then Goodreads is Kyra's favorite. I love Goodreads. Even though the interface looks like something from the early 2000s, what it does <laughs> for authors and readers is just incredible. It is the ultimate book club. The reason why I love Goodreads so much is because it is a book-centric space that is equally useful for authors and readers. Most of the other book-related book um, social media platforms that are kind of frankly, coming on the heels or trying to be like Goodreads, put much more emphasis just on the readers. Goodreads is a space that facilitates engagement between readers and authors, which is exactly what you want to enter into because you are both a reader and coming into your author-ness. So yes, it's the ultimate book club. You can talk about what you stand for in your book me messaging and how that fits into the broader mosaic of the genre or topics your books will discuss. Mm -hmm. Yep. Finally, Pinterest, the cork board. Mm. That's a great Vanderbilt. one. Yes. Is Emily and, Vanderbilt. And, <laughs> yes. Is Emily Vanderbilt. And she is one of our colleagues and she knows a lot about Pinterest. Um, but as you were saying, Mackenzie... Sure. Yes. Pinterest is a really great one for storytelling. It's underutilized. And what's really great about it is the lifespan of the things that you post on there are far longer than any of these other platforms. And what I mean by that is when you publish something on Twitter, for example, um, the opportunity that your audience has to see it before it basically disappears into the void is about 23 minutes which is really tough and means that, yeah, posting at certain times of day does matter a lot. Um, same thing with, um, for example, with TikTok, it's a little bit longer. If you post something on TikTok and nothing happens to it in the first 15 minutes, unless you have a 
like crap ton of followers, right? You should see a lot of activity in the first 15 minutes. But after that, it has a shelf life of about three weeks where randomly, you know, two and a half weeks later, it could all of a sudden get a ton of um, visual distribution. So kind of a funky one, but Pinterest, that life for a post or a pin is three months, which is really great, especially if you have a website and you've been working on one and building it up and you have a blog, you're going to want to pin your blog posts and articles to Pinterest to get more visualization for your website and your content. So creating pins, um, you could also create mood boards and things to get people excited about your work. If you want to go check out Emily Vanderbent's Pinterest, she does a great job of this. Um, you can collaborate with other authors on boards to make cute things. She invited me to one. Super fun. I think it's called like writer aesthetic. Um, but also like one thing that I do on my website is I incorporate a, a Pinterest feed that automatically updates for my specific, specifically for my new book. And it's called Artifact Hunter Vibes. So I'll just pin things that relate to the story. And it's kind of a fun way for people to explore the book um, without having read it yet. So those are the tools in your toolkit. There are of course other things like uh, Medium and your website and other ones, but these are kind of some main ones that we definitely wanted to address with you guys. So here are some inspirational accounts for each of the following. Feel free to hit pause here if you're watching it later. Feel free to screenshot it um, and go and take a look at these. Some of the reasons why we picked these, for example, on LinkedIn, um, John Saunders does a really great job, previously published author with New Degree Press, of being active on LinkedIn and really engaging with their audience in that space. That's certainly the largest part where their audience lives. Um, same for Morgan Wider, really great with the, uh, their Facebook group and has a lot of activity and that brought them great success when they were doing their fundraising campaign for the first time because they were active on Facebook, engaging people in this private community um, and talking about the book and providing consultations related to their work. Really cool stuff. Um, Kyra, any ones you would love to point out here? Um, I definitely would like to point out so particularly within the Instagram space, Haley Rogers does an excellent job. She navigates doing her personal social media alongside the social media for her podcast that she launched in tandem with her book, um, See Me Show Pod. So she just does an excellent job of diversifying her content across those two platforms. And then amongst Twitter, Haley Newland is one of the best examples of what it means to have strong continuity across multiple aspects of your brand. And she does a great job of expressing her brand on Twitter, even though Twitter can be one of those spaces that is not as geared towards aesthetics as some of the other platforms might be. So again, mm -hmm. if somebody can be an example of how to carry that over into a new space, Haley is that person. Um, and quickly on Brandon Pazabak, he was the um, it's the video guy. So throughout his entire journey, he was able to incorporate tweets and videos through, for each aspect of his writing and publishing process. And just, I'm Goodreads is awesome. So just poke around and follow some of your favorite authors on Goodreads and follow Mackenzie on TikTok. <laughs> So the differences between an author versus a book profile and page. I know we talked about this a little bit when it comes to, like we talked about a website being author versus book driven, but then there's also kind of your author versus book profile versus personal versus author. Like there's all, you can get all kinds of into the weeds here. Um, so when it comes to, having an account separate from your personal account, whether it's book driven or author driven, just like if you're at all thinking like, I already have an Instagram, but should I just start posting author things on that Instagram or should I start over and create a new account? We have two different perspectives for you. I have a personal account and an author account and Kyra has one that's merged between the two. So we're going to talk about it with you guys. Um, pros of having a separate profile, personally, from my opinion, couple things. Um, separating your audiences entirely 
is kind of a neat one. Um, so for people who are particularly interested in your work as an author, can go and live in that space where you're posting exclusively about that content. Um, because one of the things that Instagram does a uh, reward creators for is content consistency. Um, and for my personal profile, it's more of a kind of a yearbook of my life that I keep for myself where I'll just post, it's a highlight reel, right? If something fun happened that I want to remember, I put it on Instagram and it kind of just, it's a little bit randomized and that the content is consistent in that it's about me, but having an author profile where everything related to what I'm reading, what I'm writing, who I'm collaborating with, like that is my, what I use that account for. So that's a personal preference, but having it focused on just your book or writing or your business, those are pieces of that one. Um, Kyra, you want to talk about the cons? Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, I would say, so the, the cons of having a separate audience would mean that ultimately, the even if, so if you were to have two different accounts, then you would basically have to start from scratch in building the audience for the new account that you create. That in and of itself isn't a problem if you want to make sure that the right people are seeing the right content, but don't right. assume that the metrics will transfer. So, right, because it would it, probably happen either way, truthfully. Like you'll have people mm -hmm. that like people you went to college with, family members and stuff like that, that follow you and like you, but they're like, I have no interest in, in reading and won't want to look at that content. So they won't follow that right. new account. Right, exactly. So, I mean, there's also the component of in creating a separate account, that's, that's a whole other account that you need to manage. That in and of yep. itself isn't a problem. I mean, full disclosure, a huge part of the reason why I ultimately ended up merging the two is because, and I'm really exposing myself here, I didn't really have much of a social media presence before I built my, I started to build my author brand. Like my social media presence was my mom tagging me in things. So, yep. I mean, ultimately... I had a Instagram because my younger sister told me that if I cared about her, I would like her Instagram like posts and stuff. So I did that. And so basically it, I didn't really have a big personal account to maintain anyway. So I just merged the two because at the end of the day, like I would have more to say in incorporating my personal life in tandem with my author life. So that's how I navigated that decision. But even if somebody has a personal account, I mean, depending on who you know is in your audience, maybe they wouldn't mind if you just started talking more about your book because that plays yeah. a huge role in your personal life. Yep. Versus I had my Instagram and had been relatively active on it for like eight years. So I was like, you know... I'm going to start fresh with this one. So ultimately it's kind of a, it's a go with your gut thing. Um, there is no right answer. It's a great question, but there's no right answer really. Um, it's going to really have a lot to do with where your digital presence is currently and what you're comfortable with and confident that you will keep up. Um, the other piece of this too. So before I go into, Oh, before I go into, sorry for that weird noise. Um, before I go into examples, <laughs> the other piece of this too is author versus book. Um, I've seen people do it before where they'll be author driven or they'll be book driven where it's just an account that talks exclusively about the book. And my biggest recommendation, I will say that I do have an opinion on this. Make it author driven because books are sold. They're not bought, but people also don't want to feel like they're being sold to. Um, they want to feel like they're interacting with a real human. And the other thing too is I'll even find myself guilty of this. Like if I watch an author posting about their stuff on social media and posting about their milestones, and I've already read one of their books and they tell me they have another book coming out. I don't even care what it's about. I'm already like, I want to read that book because I like this author and I like their personality. And I like the things that they've been posting about, which is generally related to themes discussed in the book that I read and already liked. So like, that's my two cents on that one. Kyra, do you have additional mm -hmm. thoughts? Genu like overall, I would agree with Mackenzie in saying that if you are going to have a separate account and 
if you're making a decision between book driven and author driven overall i would agree that that author driven makes more sense because then you can infuse more of yourself into your content with that being said though the context where i could see book driven maybe being stronger is if you're building like a universe or a series because then if if mm. it wouldn't just be about the book it would be about whatever music or merch or whatever you have in the world building across multiple books across multiple mediums yeah. that kind of thing but overall i would say that particularly if you're thinking of your book and in, in, in the context of it being the beginning or extension of who you are then definitely go author definitely go author driven yep great point um so this slide's been up for a while feel free to screenshot or pause and look at these later um but these are examples of people who have their personal accounts on the left and their author accounts on the right okay so <laughs> homework, as it were, there is a social media assessment dashboard for you guys. That's the tool that I talked about in the beginning. And um, with that, it's to help you guys get a sense of where you're at in your digital progress and figure out where you have opportunities for growth. Um, if anything, I would encourage you guys, the ones who are on Quip especially, to collaborate and chat in the chat room and follow each other on your various accounts. There is another dashboard for that as well, which Kyra and I will drop into the chat where you can plug in your account on all of the things that you have and everybody can plug in all of theirs and you can just hit follow, 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 friend, friend, all those things because um, you guys are each other's audience as well, which is really important. So... Um, final words, Kyra, before we go into Q&A moment. I just think that admittedly, especially if you don't really see yourself as a social media person, navigating it at first can be a bit daunting, but it's, like, it's also really exciting because it's like, you know, there's a blank canvas. You could throw paint onto it, kind of. Like, it's, it's that moment of creation and it can come authentically from you and because there are so many different platforms you can experiment with the ways you like to express yourself totally well we're giving people a chance to ask questions here because i know they come in a couple seconds later than you actually hit enter i'd love to show off look it's my book they're little baby book earrings and i got them that's for so christmas cool. how cute that's so cool oh my gosh <laughs> Very subtle detail. Mm -hmm. oh, that's okay, we've got a question here. Where Where is the social media dashboard? Once again, we will drop that link in the main chat room on Quip so you guys uh, will have access to that. Mm -hmm. um, there was one question in here, which I think is an interesting one. So have any authors embraced the use of NFTs? Is that even possible? The short answer is yes, it is possible. The longer answer is um, I've seen it done with some traditionally published authors, but particularly ones who are more entrepreneurially, if that's a word, inclined. Um, and so I did drop another comment in the chat. There's this great article in the Wall Street Journal about Gary Vaynerchuk and how he used NFTs to launch a book. Have your own opinions about this, what you will. After you read it, I'd be interested to know. Feel free to leave comments about that at the bottom. Um, any additional questions, you guys? I'll wait a couple more seconds. Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate to ask. My I guess. kind of, I'm thinking, what would my questions be? Right. right? The I first time I started I, doing this. Right. I mean, Loki, I kind of wanted to ask you. I think, I think a question that I have, kind of for both of us, but particularly for you, Mackenzie, is how do you know where your audience, your your target audience lives? Do you just mm. start talking to the people who are already following you, see how they engage and then readjust from there? Or do you do research on, oh, like I want to target, you know, young adults and young adults are on TikTok slash Instagram. So I should put more of my stuff there. You see what I mean? I think it's definitely a little bit of both. Because I would mm -hmm. say the first place I would start is the place where I already have the most engagement. And for me, or all, and or the place where I'm most comfortable creating content. And it feels most natural and easy. 
<laughs> so I got to tell you, like Instagram is my number one place where I feel comfortable and it feels natural for me to create content um, posts with images. Um, it's very much kind of like a photo essay thing, right? Like you can take a photo and then get yourself inspired and revved up for content. Um, TikTok involves a lot of story storytelling and trend research and editing, which can get kind of to be a lot. Though at the same time, the less time I spend on a TikTok historically, the more views it gets, which I'm like, why, why does it be like, why it be like that? You know, the one I spend like half an hour editing gets no traction. And I'm like, really? Thank you. Um, but yeah, the, the places where people, when I say most engagement, I'm typically talking about where people are actually commenting and I'm talking to real people and actually messaging me and stuff. Cause likes are one thing, likes are easy. Um, but when people send me notes, that's where I want to be. Yeah, that's, um, that's a wholesome way to think about it. Great question. What is the best time of day to post? That is going to depend on your audience. So while Kyra's answering her question, I'm going to pull up a handy dandy thing and show it to you guys. Kyra, what, what do you think about um, meeting your audience where they're at? That's a really excellent question. I think I would say that you, first of all, you just post the kind of content that you feel comfortable with posting, just be consistent to who you are and to your own voice. I do think that um, it is worth doing a little bit of research on where your audience lives. Like yeah. TikTok, for example, comparatively speaking, has emerged and blossomed like relatively mm -hmm. recently. A lot of people might not even know that TikTok is a space where you need to go to address the young people because it's such a, like comparatively in the grand scheme of marketing, it's such a new thing. So I think that, um, again, I just want to reiterate a lot of what you shared, Mackenzie. It's worth making content that you enjoy making and finding the platform where you could do the most of that. Because if you're enjoying the content that you're making, yeah. people are going to feel that and then they're going to gravitate towards it. So it's like, like I, for yeah. example, have just recently realized that I love to make reels and be ridiculous in said reels. And I'm able mm -hmm. to do that kind of content in both Insta on Instagram via reels and on TikTok. And hopefully like, you know, I've got some engagement through that and it's a lot of fun. So just yeah, allow, oh, also broaden your horizons as well. It'll be fun. Yeah, <laughs> above all else, make it fun. Yes. So. To answer your question, Lauren, for Instagram, what's the best time of day to post? So what you're going to want to do is set up your Instagram to be a business account, which what this does for you, first of all, your Instagram needs to be public, which I already recommend. If you're having an author account, you want people to be able to find you. So you're going to want to make your profile public. Um, if you're a more private person, I'm not telling you that you have to do this. I'm just saying I recommend it. And if your profile is public, you can turn it into a business account, which is free to do, no big deal. But what it does is it provides you with things like you can have ad tools, you can have insights, and you can have um, at, you can add a shop and you can sell things from your Instagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap on insights. And under insights, it tells you all the things about your followers and everything. I know you're seeing a little bit of a rainbow right now. But what you'll click on is total followers. And then at the bottom, all so this is all the data about your followers. And the most valuable one is this is the most active times of day for my followers. So the answer is post during the time when your followers are most active, your followers specifically, and that will help with your engagement. So for me, I typically try to post somewhere around like one because the other thing too, one, my time is going to be 11 a.m. Pacific time and new and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And wherever your followers are, think about what they might be doing. If they're on a lunch break, it's a really good time to be scrolling through Instagram. Um, if it's the evening right after work, when you've just gotten home, maybe you're having a snack, good time to scroll. Um, think about the times when you're typically looking on Instagram. That also is going to give you some insight into when might be a good time to post. All right. So if there are no other burning questions, 
then that is all we have for you as far as today li today's live stream goes. If you do come up with more questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. We will come back and answer them or uh, reach out to us on Quip if you're in Quip and want to ask us there. Otherwise, that's it for today, friends. Bye, y'all.